Estamos de regresso para mais um episódio da série da Fundação Francisco Manuel dos Santos Isto não é assim tão simples e hoje vamos tentar descomplicar, desmontar uma matéria que na verdade é bastante complexa, que é a economia global. Se já era bastante difícil de analisar antes uh, da pandemia do Covid e também da guerra na Ucrânia, mais difícil se tornou desde então. Mas é isso que vamos tentar fazer com a ajuda do nosso convidado especial de hoje, Michael Spence. O Michael é um conceituado uh, economista, um, vencedor do Prémio Nobel da Economia em 2001, é também professor nas universidades de Nova York e Stanford e um autêntico craque no que diz respeito uh, ao estudo sobre mercados laborais internacionais. Uh, Michael, it's an absolute uh, uh, pleasure, privilege to have you on the show and it is quite a tough topic to tackle once we get into the uh, uh, global economy but as an expert you're going to try to let us uh, achieve this and uh, let's start with a macro view of what we're dealing with at the moment um, and, and, and make a brief comparison uh, uh, regarding the global economy the powers uh, at play and the dynamics between those superpowers pre-covid and post-covid because Obviously, it had such a big impact. That and the war that is going on in Ukraine uh, now as well, of course. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. And, um, you know, it's a very, very complex and uncertain environment. Uh, so I think the best we can do is sort of, you know, kind of capture the trend. So at the most macro level, you know, growth is slowing dramatically in the global economy and pretty much everywhere. I mean, China's going to have a very tough year. The global estimates of growth, you know, by the World Bank and the IMF have dropped to just above 2%. We haven't seen that in years. Mm. Um, now, what's causing this? Well, um, you know, we have very badly congested supply chains, and it's becoming increasingly evident that that's going to go on for a long time. Uh, you know, we have inflation as a result of that, uh, which is then starting to worry central banks. So we have rising interest rates. Uh, volatility and a certain amount of fear in the financial markets, so that won't help. Uh, you know, and then when the war came along, you, you know, Europe basically has decided, I think correctly, but uh, to undertake the difficult and expensive process of diversifying their energy sources away from the so the Russians, Russian, uh, especially Russian gas. Um, that'll take a little time, um, but it'll be more expensive as well. And so, you know, you hear the, the recession word. I mean, I, I think whether you have a recession depends on where you are in the world. Um, but, but for sure, it doesn't really matter if you're just talking about dramatic growth slowdown. So it's a pretty tough environment, fr frankly, um, with lots of difficult decisions. The central banks are basically trying to go down a narrow corridor and get at least reduce inflation. Um, without sort of producing a sudden stop in various economies. And that's, they will say, very, very difficult uh, thing to, to accomplish. Well, we'll get into diversification in, in, in a moment. But first, I, I did want to uh, uh, focus on, on inflation just because it's something that's affecting us all. I think we've all noticed a rise in, in prices, whether that's uh, petrol or, or, or gas or electricity or, or just basic goods in, in supermarkets. How worried, and let's focus more on Western Europe, how worried should we be about inflation and how long it can last and what governments and banks can do about it? Well, I think we should be worried. Um, and be, because I think the proximate cause, so there's two parts to inflation, basically. You know, one, inflation normally gets triggered when you have sort of some kind of problem on the supply side. Maybe it's slow productivity growth. In this case, it's a whole bunch of congestion. Um, you know, that the, the, the supply chain, global supply chains can't handle. Basically, the global supply chains were set up in a, in a pretty unbumpy you know, un, unshock prone world. So they're wound tightly, they're highly decentralized, they're very complex, nobody knows exactly what's going on, so they're myopic. Uh, you know, there's no database, for example, that you can go to and figure out what's going on in the supply chains. So people misguessed the magnitude of these blockages. Um, and I think, you know, now we're starting to realize that, you know, it's actually a world um, in which they're pretty important and much longer lasting than we thought. And I would add to that, you know, that, 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 that in, we went through about 30 years 
um, of fairly powerful deflationary forces coming from the global economy as the relative price of manufactured goods went down. You know, massive amounts of previous, previously under, unutilized productive capacity came into the global economy from emerging, emerging economies. And we've used up a lot of that capacity. And in this, at the same time, we've produced tens and tens of millions of new middle-class consumers. And so we find ourselves in a world that we, we were really not used to, um, in which that deflationary force is fading. Um, and uh, and, and this, the constraints on growth tend to be on the supply and productivity side, as opposed to on the demand side, which was the world we lived in pretty much continuously after the great financial crisis. So that's, you know, so part one is, you know, uh, we've got extended periods in which we're going to have shortages and, and upward pressure on prices. And then, of course, wages and stuff will follow. Uh, but at some point, you build in inflationary ex expectations. So this is part two. <clears throat> Once they get built in, then if you take away, you know, the supply and demand imbalances, you still have inflation. Right. We, mm -hmm. we experienced this in the 1970s. Some places still have this kind of dynamic, you know, indexed wage contracts and stuff like that. And that's when the central banks have a very difficult problem because they, to be to take those expectations out of the system takes a pretty um, aggressive uh, set of monetary policies of the type that Volcker produced, you know, produced in the early 1980s. So the hope is we're not there with embedded um inflationary expectations. Um, and the hope is that, you know, eventually we can get the global supply chains to produce, you know, more or less what demand <coughs> is asking them to produce. But if they if if they can't, meaning if the supply chains can't meet that demand, and admittedly it surged after the pandemic, because in a lot of places, household spending power was uh, stayed up because governments helped them, uh, you know, not have to, not experience too much balance sheet damage. So anyway, if we can't make it, you know, if we can't bring them back into balance by bringing the supply side up, then central banks are going to force, be forced to bring it into balance by by using monetary policy to bring the, de the demand side down. It's interesting, Michael, because I think wherever you look, you, you find a, a, um, a shortage of, of supply, uh, whether it's friends of mine who have restaurants who are looking for uh, uh, staff, whether it's uh, uh, just the, the labor market overall has obviously changed a lot during COVID as well. So the supply and demand of, of, of labor, obviously those dynamics have changed and we'll get into that later. But whether it's COVID affecting a lot of the businesses closing down and factories closing down or having to uh, decrease their, their production and then the war affecting obviously the, the energy supply and the wheat supply. I mean, everywhere you look, there seems to be friction. So how are we going to get out of this and whose responsibility is to try to add some stability to this dynamic? Because we know Russia is a major problem there on the energy side and obviously is creating a huge issue with the supply of many other goods out of Ukraine. But what, what can China and the US especially as the two, I guess, major in, influential powers do to give us some more stability so we can look at, at getting out of this? Well, there's a kind of short and longer run agenda. So I think China's in a very difficult position right now. I mean, they have COVID blockages. They're blocking ports. They're blocking <laughs> manufacturing. <laughs> they're even blocking domestic consumption. So they're going to have a very unusual, um, unusually low growth rate this year, probably in low single digits, which hasn't happened for a long, long time in China. Mm. But they'll probably get out of it. So part of the answer is, you know, at some point, China will put, this uh, COVID in the rear view mirror and start to function normally. And when they do, um, they'll be running at growth rates of five and five and a half percent. And a, fa a fair amount, you know, not all, but a fair amount of this will will recede. Um, I'll, I'll step by the labor market things because I think they're kind of probably more permanent. Um, mm, so okay. we'll talk about that later. Okay. Yeah. Um, but there's all kinds of um, things in a slightly longer run that you can do um, if you're serious about productivity growth, right? Uh, I mean, the digital technologies, for example, are very powerful instruments. Mm -hmm. um, you can have sort of policies that are designed to, to sustain the accelerated pace of adoption that we got in the pandemic economy, um, provide incentives for go sort of going down that road and helping people make the adjustments in terms of skills and whatnot. Um, so I think, you know, <clears throat> 
I, yeah, I find it hard to give you a sort of a good answer that solves the problem in two to three years. But after that, yeah. I think we got a lot of tools available to us. OK, um, obviously, trade diversification is something which has uh, been at the center of, of discussions, especially since since the war started and, and Europe had to yep. find other alternatives to Russia. What, what have we learned and, and, and who can be a, a good model for, for let's say, the, the EU, EU countries or European countries to follow uh, as far as, 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 as someone who, uh, or, or um, a government who, who uh, is, is a benchmark for trade diversification and who, who, who uh, does not depend too much on one energy supply or on, on one uh, a source uh, uh, for, uh, for, um, uh, for, for goods? Well, I'm not sure there's an excellent model. On the energy side, I, you know, I found that Japan for a long time had managed to diversify their um, their energy sources. And Japan is a place that is essentially completely or almost completely dependent on foreign, so foreign sources for fossil mm -hmm. fuels. Mm -hmm. So in all three, coal, gas, um, and, uh, and, and oil, um, they're really quite diversified. Now that doesn't make, it, it, you know, nothing gives you perfect protection in this world, no. but they're a whole lot better shape. Um, than, than we are in Europe because of our dependence, especially on Russian gas. And we did that because it was cheap. Um, so now we're going to sort of learn, you know, what it's like <laughs> to change that pattern and diversify away. And I think the European commitment to doing that is A, correct, and B, um, pretty serious. I mean, I, I wouldn't expect a, a reversion here. There are some bright spots in this. I mean, Europe, you know, but because of the war, and because of having to meet this challenge together, um, has responded to both to the pandemic and to this challenge in a more unified fashion than they mm -hmm. did with respect to the great financial crisis. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it may, I'm, I'm not sure of this, but it may, you know, tip the balance in Europe to, to a recognition that, that, the, that the European economy, which is huge, is a really a powerful force in the world uh, for the benefit of European citizens, but everybody else as well. And it's especially powerful if they're acting, you know, together and not squabbling. So, I mean, the hope is we won't go back to squabbling and, mm. you know, focusing on our differences rather than, than the other. But the other important thing to say about diversification is it's not going to stop uh, with energy and whatnot. I mean, I think what, one of the things that you observe is that this global economy, which has these tightly wound supply chains that don't respond well to shocks, um, is increasingly shock prone, you know, from climate change, from pandemics, from geopolitical tensions, you know, from all kinds of sources. And the, and the rational response to that, I think, is going to be um, to diversify, um, you know, and, and once that process gets started, um, it's going to make the architecture of global supply chain just completely different than what we're used to over many decades. I mean, our global supply chains were based on, you know, going and finding and utilizing relatively cheap labor. Uh, they were based on efficiency and comparative advantage. They weren't very resilient, it turns mm -hmm. out. Um, well, that's all sort of gone. I mean, and, and this diversification process is not gonna be just a private sector phenomenon. I mean, you can clearly see emerging policies in multiple countries, Europe, you know, collectively, the United States, China, for sure, you know, that are moving in the direction of diversifying their dependence on any, anybody in both the supply and the demand chains, meaning not just supply chains, but which markets, you know, you are depending on mm. uh, to sell your goods, or at least the ones you export, goods and services. So um, I expect this pattern um, to be one of the most important, you know, sort of changes that we're going to see in the next in the next decade, and it will be driven by essentially, you know, economic, national, energy, and food, and other kinds of security considerations, which are just different from efficiency. When one looks at the at the global economy and the the, the forces at play here, obviously. Uh, we have to talk about the the transition to to digital, which you've already uh, uh, mentioned. Um, right. How is access to technology, in your view, affecting who grows and who doesn't? Um, I think it's a very, very important factor. Uh, you know, let's see. I mean, 
one of the things you observe is there's a correlation between growth and this global expansion of entrepreneurial activity that we're observing now. So, you know, go back 15 years and you can count on the fingers of two hands uh, or less, um, you know, where most of the sort of technology, science and technology oriented innovation and growth companies and whatnot was going on <clears throat> just isn't true anymore. It's going on in the United States, multiple places in Europe, China, Latin America. There's seven unicorns in Africa uh, at the moment, depending on which day you look at the market valuations. I mean, the valuations, but uh, it's, you know, so digital is a pretty important part of the future story. I think it's an important part now. I mean, you know, in, at least in some sectors like tech, like finance and so on, digital is moving sort of very rapidly. And because of the pandemic, it's moving very rapidly in sectors that were lagging before, mm -hmm. like education and health and a whole lot of others. Um, when I listen to people and you know who, who actually operate in global supply chains, they're basically gonna do two things. And I think they're gonna get it done eventually. <clears throat> One is to flip those supply chains. So they start not with the raw materials and whatnot, they start with the, the, um, the customer regardless of whether it's a business or a family or an individual, and then build the whole supply chain on a digital foundation back from that. And the digital technologies enable that. Now that won't get done overnight, but uh, but I think it will happen. And you can't do it without the digital technologies. You just don't have you know, the tools, the information and control tools that uh, that are required to pull that off. So, yeah, I think digital is, you know, even now a pretty important correlate of, you know, potential growth. And in the future, it'll be an even more important. As you mentioned during during COVID, really, uh, those who had access to technology uh, had a, had an instant uh, advantage. And then certain industries certainly learned a lot on how to adapt and how to innovate during this this period of time. How, how many of mm -hmm. these trends do you think are here to stay? And when uh, you look in the in the global labor market and you see an increase in the number of remote uh, jobs that, that that are available Do, how much of this is permanent in in your opinion for for the new uh, uh, generation of professionals who are entering the market now versus five years ago or ten years ago how much has changed in that dynamics of uh, uh, looking for a job getting for a job and being located in the headquarters of whatever uh, uh, company you're you're working for? Um, so I think it's getting, you know, for the next generation more important um, to become, I mean, this sort of happens automatically, that each generation is, auto, is sort of automatically more comfortable with the emerging technology. So mm, right. if you take people, if you take people like me and sort of ask, you know, well, what do you think about the metaverse? We barely get it. Uh, <laughs> Whereas, whereas the young people, they don't have any problem at all. You know, they've been gaming for years. You know, they're, they're used to taking advantage, thinking about and taking advantage of, you know, sort of alternative realities. And I've met people just recently who are going to use this kind of background and experience and young people um, to do very rapid, you know, design um, and that kind of thing. So I think it, in some ways it's sort of it's sort of revolutionary. Um, you know, the digital technologies are, are are producing in some dimensions just dramatically inclusive growth patterns. You can get the people with the right digital technologies and infrastructure that are basically remote, anonymous, you know, hard to deal with in the conventional world. And so in a lot of companies, their profitability comes from not all, but a lot of, a, of a, their profitability comes precisely from accessing clients, customers, and so on, who are otherwise out there, you know, untouched by, by various aspects, services, and even goods. And the global, you see this in e-commerce, you see it in fintech for sure. Uh, you know, they're touching people because of mobile payment systems and data that the traditional financial institutions, at least when they're not armed with the same kind of data, have very great difficulty dealing with. There's just lots of people with no, no accessible track record before this, no collateral, no nothing. They're just unknowns. Uh, and so, you know, and then you see it in healthcare and education, as I mentioned before. I mean, it's pretty exciting. 
Um, but what hasn't happened yet, and then, and then I'll try to answer the question about, <laughs> you know, how much this is permanent. Yeah. Um, the acceleration was real. I think the markets, a subset of the markets thought, well, we'll have a permanent acceleration. That was a, that's a bad idea. <laughs> um, and they're resetting in part because of that and in part because the interest rate environment is changing. And the, you know, that resetting is pretty violent, as you well know. Um, so there was, you know, over enthusiasm about how much change was going to stick. On the other hand, uh, you know, the chances of, uh, so the, you know, projecting that kind of acceleration into the future was, it, you know, an unrealistic idea. On the other hand, um, you know, we learned a lot uh, in the course of being forced to use digital, you know, when we didn't have an alternative. And a subset of those learnings, whether it's for individuals or, in, or institutions, are actually pretty valuable. And so the ones that we'll keep are the ones that are actually valuable. And let me take education just to make it concrete. You know, education was lagging in the use of technology. You can bring lots of resources into traditional educational processes and classrooms using this technology in principle, but we weren't doing it, or we weren't doing it very well. Um, then we had to do it, right? Um, but the natural role in lots of contexts, including education, for this digital technology is as a complement, you know, an add-on, an, an augmentation of what's there traditionally. So if you ask the question, well, as a result of all this digital technology and hybrid, you know, or, you know, offline classrooms, um, you know, online classrooms, are, are we going to, you know, stay with that? The answer is no. Right. I mean, there's just huge value, regardless of whether you're in kindergarten or in college, you know, of having these interpersonal interactions. Uh, but are we going to use the technology to, you know, probably dramatically enhance the quality, you know, and the richness of the educational process? I think the answer is yes. If you go to healthcare, you get the same thing. If you, before the pandemic, if you asked doctors and their patients, whether they were interested in using online consultations when mm -hmm. it made sense. Mm -hmm. um, and the answer was essentially unanimously no, no on both sides of the market. Well, that's not the answer anymore, right? People have decided you can actually do this reasonably well. And if you have a sensible balance between sort of in-person interaction and the doctor actually looking at you and, you know, taking tests and whatnot and, and, uh, and, you know, we're going to have a proliferation of at-home tests that are increasingly reliable mm -hmm. as well. So everywhere you look, I think you're going to see um, change not at the pace the markets thought might happen, but, uh, but, but real change. And change that was faster than we would have experienced without the pandemic. I did want to touch on on, on Portugal just a little bit, uh, Michael, because yep. what, what I've noticed here, especially since the pandemic, is that this has become a more and more attractive destination for a lot of young people who are working remotely, who have an opportunity to have some kind of hybrid uh, arrangement. Um, tapping into your experience and, and expertise, what can a country like Portugal uh, stand to gain from this influx of, of expats coming, coming here? Um, and, and what advice could you give the government to make sure that this remains attractive and that also the, the, the locals are not, are not priced out of this, of this phenomenon? Yeah, that's a complicated thing. So you, the hope is, uh, and I'd, I'd be a little surprised if you had a sort of, you know, a kind of thriving you know, tech ecosystem, which is, what is it, what's it happening around the world, right? I mean, you, mm -hmm. don't have, you don't have kind of tech companies scattered all over the landscape anywhere, right? Right. In, if you look at France, they're, you know, virtually all in Paris. If you look at Germany, they're virtually all in Berlin. I mean, it's a bit of an exaggeration, but you get the idea. Mm -hmm. So this notion that it's a kind of highly interpersonal thing is 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 still there and it's important. I would hope, you know, I got, let me put it this way. I'd be worried if that, you know, if that tech a ecosystem that's developing in Portugal, you know, I don't know whether it's in Lisbon or Porto or Lisbon mostly. or whatever. Yeah. What Lisbon mostly? Mostly. Yeah, I'd be a little worried if it's all expats. Um, you know, that doesn't make any sense because there's talented, you know, entrepreneurial, creative people in every country. And so, uh, I guess you know, if I saw that start to develop, I'd, I'd, you know, 
either advise or directly go into diagnostics as to the question why the local, you know, young creative young people aren't, you know, sort of being part of this. Because uh, that, that is not what we've seen in most places. Uh, it, it's a little bit the reverse. I mean, it's true that the um, these ecosystems developed because some global players, you know, or players that were really experienced went global. You know, the Sequoias of the world or, you know, the General Atlantics of the world who know how to build you know, growth companies and whatnot, but they're but they're populated mostly by local people, and they're mainly funding locals. Uh, and so um, you've kind of blindsided me with this. If that's a pattern, and it's one that I haven't seen before, it's obviously that, that there's a, a, a Portuguese presence in the startup phenomenon, especially in the technology sector. But what what has been clear to see, especially since COVID, is that with Portugal being such an attractive destination from a quality of life perspective, the number yep. of expats and especially young expats coming here to live has increased uh, uh, exponentially. So that's yeah. that's what I've well, seen you know, in Lisbon. You, yeah, that's interesting. You, you know, I mean, in some ways, probably what you may be seeing is something a little bit like what we see in the United States, right? I mean, when you, when you go into Silicon Valley, right. you don't see a bunch of sort of, you know, fourth generation Europeans only, right? You see Indians and Chinese and, you know, a whole lot of other people. Um, and and they're attracted in part by just the attraction of the environment. That was one of the sort of selling points for Silicon Valley before it was a kind of powerhouse. But they're also attracted by the ecosystem itself, right? So you, if you put those two things together, um, then it may not be too worrying that you've got no. a nation of sort of locals and the other folks interacting in that environment, as long as the locals aren't being cut out, uh, you know, by that system. Yeah. Yeah. If it's inclusive. There's, a, well, there's one other, there's one other thing that happens. These, these people get rich fairly quickly and they bid up the prices of everything. So there's another batch of locals, <laughs> you know, who find they can't afford to live anywhere near downtown Lisbon. And that's a different kind of problem. Maybe, mm -hmm. You know, you can see that problem in Silicon Valley. There's people who don't participate directly in the tech sector in the sense of being the principals, but it, but work there. And a lot of them are commuting from very long distances away because of affordability of the environment. And so that's a role in which government, you know, has a, a, a significant role to pay, play to kind of keep control of the the local system so that there's room for everybody, whether it's housing costs or other things, because you don't want to populate downtown, you know, Lisbon with all financial types or all tech mm -hmm. types. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not where you want to go. Yeah. Look, I think there's a, a huge opportunity for Portugal to continue to expand in becoming uh, more of an international uh, uh, um, I, I think hub for for a lot right. of entrepreneurs, uh, and it's something that obviously needs to have a balance as well uh, uh, in the local uh, population. And uh, I guess we'll see what happens in the in, in the coming years. I mean, if there are more comparisons between uh, uh, Lisbon and Silicon Valley, I guess that that wouldn't be a bad thing. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, close out this interview by asking by asking you a, a, a few quick fire questions. So in one sure. in one word or one sure. sentence, I would like you to try to answer these these questions. So the first sure. is, what is one personality trait a good leader could really benefit from having in your view? Humility. That comes up quite a bit. Um, I, yeah, definitely key. What is the biggest challenge humanity faces today in your view? No, sustainability, I think. Without question, in my mind, without question. If you could change one thing in the world today by magic, I guess, or superpower, what would that be? I would get rid of the geopolitical tensions uh, that I think are, you know, in danger of inhibiting the functioning of the global economy mm. at full potential for the benefit of everybody. I think it's, uh, if, if I could magically snap my fingers and get rid of something, I'd get rid of that. And what is the most important learning of your life and career? Um, that's, 
<laughs> I know it's a big one. That's a, no, that's an interesting question. I, I think the, the most important thing I've learned is that what you have to contribute changes with your age, you know, and you need to sort of accept that. Um, so young people are at their most creative, very, very, you know, in their early adulthood. We have to take advantage of that and support them. And as you get older, you know, your ability to recognize patterns and, and uh, your experience, you know, comes into play and is, you know, something valuable to contribute. But I, I think, you know, outside of kind of family life, the most important thing I've learned is there's a natural evolution and, uh, and the way to think about it or the way to react to it is to kind of go, go with the flow, so to speak. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, we've certainly really appreciated having you share all the experience that you've been able to gather throughout your, your life and career here with us when uh, talking about such an important topic, uh, such as the, the global economy, which obviously uh, could serve uh, to fill various uh, programs more than just uh, one, certainly more than our conversation here, Michael. But thank you so much for uh, uh, having the availability to, to, to share your insight. And it was an absolute pleasure to discuss this with you. It was for me too, and thank you for having me. A pleasure. Um prazer de ter aqui o Michael Spence, um, Prémio Nobel de Economia em 2001, a ajudar a explicar por que razão isto da economia global não é assim tão simples. Até breve.